So hi everyone, uh, I am uh, Sophie Valk and I work at Surfax in Toulouse and I'm a research engineer in climate modeling and my main area of interest is uh, code coupling. Uh, so I will present the second part of this session on parallel programming in, pro in practice and if you have questions please write them to the chat. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I can I can read the question in the ch chat as I'm not sharing, so that that's good. Next slide, please. Okay, so coupling of code is an example of coarse grain task parallelism, where in fact each code is a task for itself. So you always have interest in coupling your codes because then you can run them uh, concurrently uh, on different resources and you can add an extra level of parallelism with respect to the parallelism of the code themselves. So the objective of this, ta of this talk is to describe the concepts of code coupling. To, uh, I, will, I will try to uh, describe the different aspects that impact uh, couple model performance. And then I will classify the different coupling software that are used in climate modeling. And, uh, and, then I will, um, and then I will describe the, yeah, sorry, I will first classify the coupling software and then I will describe the most, the, the coupling software that are mostly used in climate and weather application. Next slide, please. So I will start with an introduction and then I will talk about sequential versus concurrent coupling. And then I will say a word about the global performance of a coupled system. And then I will describe the different technical solutions that exist to do code coupling. And then I will, as I said, uh, present the coupling software that are used today in climate modeling. And then I will present the coupling algorithms that are, that are implemented in selected couple general circulation models, and then I will finally finish with a, with a summary. Next slide, please. So what does coupling of code mean? It means, I mean, you have two codes, but you want to run them and you want them to interact. So it means exchanging and transforming the information at the interface of those codes. And it needs, of course, to do this in a, in, a, in a coordinated way. So you also have to manage the execution and the synchronization of the codes. So why do, you want, why do we want to couple different codes? Of course, it's because we want to model a system globally and not only uh, part by part. So one example is the modeling of an engine where you may want to couple a fluid code to a structure code because the the deformation of the structure have, has an impact on the fluid flow and vice versa. And another, of course, uh, very good example of code coupling is ocean atmosphere coupling for climate modeling. You want to model the ocean, the atmosphere, but also, of course, their interaction. Next slide, please. So what are the constraints of, co of code coupling? Well, the coupling, ideally must be easy to implement and portable. It must be flexible in the sense that you should be able to easily exchange the components, the coupling fields, the coupling frequencies, and so on. A big constraint in code coupling is that very often you start from existing and independently developed codes. And of course, you will have to run your coupled code on a computing platform and you have to take care about of the computing platform characteristics and the oper operating system characteristics and limits. Next slide, please. So, yeah, thank you. So, so when you when you do code coupling and when you run a couple of code, you have, of course, you want the global performance of the couple system to be good. And you have to take care of three aspects. And usually it's not possible to optimize all those three. So the first one is the load balancing. The load balancing is a measure of whether or not all the computing resources are used all the time. 
For example, if one component model is waiting while the other is running, then this is this leads to waste of resources and this leads to a bad load balancing. So you want to optimize the load balancing. Next slide, please. Another thing you want to optimize is the simulation throughput in the sense that you want to get your results as fast as you can. And the measure of that is how much simulated years of climate can you do per actual real day. So it's a SYPD. And then the third one is the CPU cost. So how much in total does it does it cost for you to to get your results? So this is measure in how many cores you have to use for how many hours to simulate it to simulate one year. So this is called CHSY. Next one please. Well yeah. So usually it's impossible to define a layout that will optimize all those criteria. If you have a perfectly load balanced system, that is you are using the resources all the time, it may be that this will not give you the optimal throughput, that it may be that you will run slower than what you could. It may also be that you have to um, to use more CPU to get a, um, a, a, a better throughput. So you, you, you get your result faster, but it's costing you more. So, so when you optimize a, a coupled system, you have to take care of those three criteria and you have to understand which criteria is the most important for you. Next slide, please. So the second part on sequential and concurrent copying. Next slide, please. So by nature, uh, the climate system is concurrent in the sense that the ocean and the atmosphere, they evolve continuously and they exchange momentum, water and heat flux continuously at the interface. But to model the climate system, we have to solve equations which are discretized in space and in time and different coupling algorithms can be implemented. And you can play on the lags between the different coupling fields. And the performance of your coupled system, which is implemented uh, on your computing platform, will be impacted uh, by the way you implement your coupling algorithm. Of course, you cannot do anything you like. The science will determine what coupling algorithm is acceptable or not. And basically, you have two main types of uh, coupling algorithm. They can be either sequential or concurrent. Next slide, please. Yes. So this figure illustrates a typical, typical sequential component. You see that the first component starts in the, in the oh yeah, I don't have the mouse. Uh, in the upper uh, left uh, graph, you see that, so the time is going on as a horizontal line. At the top, it's, uh, it, it models the running of one component, one model, and at the bottom in pink, the running of the other model. So basically those components are sequential in the sense that the first component starts, runs a part of its couple of its time step, and then it delivers F1 of T to the second component that can then start only its time step. And then the second component runs it runs and then delivers F2, which is needed by uh, the first component to finish its time step. So when you see this algorithm, you see that basically that when the component one is running, component two cannot do anything and vice versa. And a typical example of this is the implicit resolution of the heat diffusion equation from the top of the atmosphere model to the bottom of the land or the ice model. Um, this uh, diffusion equation, when it is uh, discretized, oops, sorry, I just uh, this uh, diffusion equation, when it is discretized, it leads to a tri-diagonal matrix 
that can be solved within um, um, with a down and up sweep. And basically, when you solve the coefficient of the matrix in the atmospheric level, you cannot do anything for your in the land level and vice versa. Next slide, please. But, okay, so these are basically sequential components. But if you allow your component to use the coupling field delivered by the other component from the previous time step, then you will be allowed, then you will be able to run them concurrently. You see, this is what is happening here in the, at the, at the, in the graph at the bottom. You see that for the time step t minus 1, uh, the model 1 produces f1 t minus 1. But then it needs, and then to, 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 to go on with its time step, it needs f2. But then by playing on the lags of the different fields, you, you, you implement your coupling so that it's the f2 from the previous time step that is used, which means that the first component does not have to wait for the second uh, component to, to run the same time step. It just uses the, time, the, 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 the coupling field produced by the time step before. So you see here that by playing on the lags of the different coupling fields, you can, in fact, if your science tells you that it's okay to do so, you can, in fact, run in parallel on different set of resources, two components, that would have to be run sequentially. But of course, this is only if your science tells you that it's okay to do that. You use the coupling field produced at the time step before. Next, next slide, please. Here you have an illustration of concurrent components. And this is typically what we have in ocean atmosphere models. So you see here that, again, this is at the uh, upper left corner. It's an illustration on, of how the model run time is horizontal. At the top, you have the execution of one component. And at the bottom, the execution of the second component. So you see that they both run at the same time on different sets of resources, of computing resources, of course. They, they all run their time step t. And then they produce a coupling field. Uh, so the first component produces F1, and then the second component produces F2. And these coupling fields are used as boundary condition for the next, the next time step. This is typically what we call asynchronous coupling, because you see here that for one particular time step, the model will, will run using the coupling field produced by the other component time step before. So there's some asynchronicity here. So this is not, of course, perfect. But usually in ocean atmosphere, we said, you know, we, we, we consider that it's okay to do so. And, and then we can run these, the models like that. Next slide, please. But of course, even, I mean, you can change the, the sequence of exchange of the coupling field, and you can also decide to run those components sequentially. In the, at the bottom here, you see that, for example, the component 2 runs its time step t. It produces f2 of t, which is used by the, compo the first component to run its time step t. The first component produces f1 of t, which is then used by uh, the second component to run the next time step. So here you see that uh, basically there's an asynchronicity between component 1 and component 2 for f1, because f1 of t is used to run uh, component 2 at the next time step, but there's no asynchronicity for the coupling fields produced by the second component, by the component two to run the component one. So basically, the idea here is just that, I mean, you have your science that tells you to implement something, but by playing and by, by and depending on the stability of your system, you may decide to implement your coupling exchanges differently 
so to use your computing resources differently. So next slide, please. So this will have implication on the global performance of your coupled system. Again here, I take the example of sequential components. That is, one is running while one is running, the other cannot run because it's waiting for something and vice versa. So if you have your, uh, uh, if, if, you, if you have your sequential component, you may want to implement sequential coupling. And in this uh, sequential coupling, basically, so this is an illustration of how it works. Time now is going from uh, the top of the graph on the right to the bottom. And you have here uh, the different columns uh, illustrate the different computing resources you have. So here, we suppose that we have three, the, we have the components that run on three cores. So basically you see that when you do sequential coupling, you use all your resources here, all the three cores to first run component one, and then you switch to component two. So all your resources are used to run component two, and then back again to component one. So if you, if you have sequential component, this will be the optimal way to use your resources because the resources are used all the time to run one the components one after the other. Next slide, please. Oh, next one. Yeah. So you see here that the advantages and disadvantages of this uh, of this configuration, this this way of using your computing resources. Regarding the load balancing, this will be very good because you see that you are using your resources, your three cores here, you are using them all the time. But it may not be optimal for the CPU, for the cost of CPU, because when you run your components like that, you will force both components to run on the same number of cores, of course. Of course. And this may not be optimal for one of the components. So you may uh, not reach, you know, the best one, the best uh, scaling point in, in your scaling curve to run one one or the other component, and overall this will lead to a waste of resources. So perfectly low balance, but maybe not optimal for the CPU. Um, it's not optimal either for the throughput because as you're running the throughput, that means and how many times you get your result. Because here you're losing one level of parallelism. You, you, you're not running your component concurrently, so you, you're using that level of parallelism. So it could be that if you would run your component at the same time on different sets of resources, then you would get a better throughput. Also, there are, uh, there's another uh, disadvantage, is that when you do this, you have to blend, you have to mix your two components into one code, and then you may have conflicts. Regarding the coupling itself, it may be quite good for the efficiency of the coupling exchanges because as you are running your two components within one same code um, uh, on the same uh, resources, then you can exchange the coupling fields through the memory. But it's not very good regarding the coupling algorithm. In fact, you have no flexibility. The only thing you can do is that one component one produce a coupling field that are then used by component two that then produce the coupling fields to be sent to component one. But you have no other coupling algorithm that you can implement. So the other type, the other way of using resources, next slide please, is concurrent coupling. And this is typically how you want to run concurrent components. When you do this, this is again time on, on the right. This is time going uh, from the top to the, to the bottom. And you have the different columns are uh, illustrate different uh, computing resources, that is different cores. So here you see that component one is running on three cores. And then at the same time, uh, component two is running on two cores, core uh, four and core five. And when you do that, Basically, 
Uh, next slide, please. So this may be very good for the throughput because you, you added one, compared to the previous case, you added one level of parallelism, your components are running in parallel at, um, and concurrently at the same time. Um, and if uh, load balancing is a very delicate issue here because then you have to make sure that you run the first component on a certain number of cores and that you run your other component on another number of cores so that they both finish at the same time. So that you, you, what you want to avoid is that one component uh, waits for the other. So it may be, so then the, you, if you have a load balancing system, your components will run, will take as much time to run but it might not be uh, optimal for the CPU because you may have to run one of these components not at the optimal scaling point. When you do this, when you run your different components as separate executables on different sets of resources, uh, you keep your, uh, your original codes uh, separate, so you, have, uh, you reduce the, 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 possib the, the possibility of conflicts. And regarding the coupling algorithm, it's quite flexible because as they are running at the same time, basically you can, and, and you have to use, I mean, a, a drawback is that you have, you cannot exchange the coupling fields through the memory. You have to use something like message passing. But because you do this, then you have all the flexibility you want in the exchange, in, in how you implement the, the sequence of the, uh, the exchange of the coupling fields. Okay, so basically, just to just as a summary, your science can tell you that you have either sequential or concurrent components, and this will have an impact on how you use your computing resources. You can use sequential coupling, and in that case, you will run your two components, one after the other, on the same set of resources. And or you can run uh, or you can implement some concurrent coupling, and in that case you will run your components on different sets of resources, uh, and they will run concurrently at the same time. And both uh, implementation have some advantages and disadvantages, as I just presented. Next slide, please. Now regarding the technical solution. In practice, how do you do, how do you do coupling? The first thing you have you can do is that you have your original programs, program one and then program two, and you transform one of these into a subroutine, and you have the first program one here calling program two as a subroutine. This is typically how the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere is implemented at ECMWF. Uh, NEMO, the ocean NEMO, is really called as a subroutine of IFS. So you end up with one code which merge the two components, one being a subroutine of the other. The, the advantages is that it's, it can be quite efficient regarding the coupling because again, you, have, you, you are uh, within the same uh, code, so you are running on the same uh, nodes, so then you can exchange the coupling fields as argument here, uh, argument of, the, uh, of um, when you call the subroutine, uh, so it can be quite efficient. It may be uh, also easier to debug and easier to, um, to manage for the operating system because you've merged the two components in the, into one uh, a, one big code, and you have only one executable to care. Um, it might not be for regarding the disadvantages. It might not be really easy to implement the existing code because you really have to transform one as a subroutine of the other, and it's not really flexible because the coupling algorithm is basically hard coded. The coupling algorithm is really I mean you have you, you you run a part of program one. And then it transfers some data as argument, and then and then uh, program two runs as a subroutine, and then it produces some data. But that's the only sequence of exchange that you can do. 
And of course, as you're not using any tool, any software designed for that, you don't have any uh, generic transformation or interpretation to go from the grid of one component to the other. Next slide, please. So the second way of really implementing the coupling is, uh, for example, use an existing communication protocol such as MPI, PVM, or other things. Here, basically, you keep your um, your original program as separate programs, so you will have two executables running at the same time on your computing platform. And then within program one, you 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 implement is a a, a specific uh, sending action here, where you specify that program one sends some data, data out here, to program two. And in program two, you have to uh, specifically uh, implement a receiving call from program one uh, to get some data. So this is a bit easier to implement with existing code than the previous solution because you keep your program separate. But again, it's not that easy to implement because you need to be an expert of the protocol. You need to know how to implement your, your I call XXX send and XXX receive. Uh, it's not very flexible because you really ha you have hard coded your coupling exchanges. Uh, again, you're not using any generic tools, so you don't have any generic transformation or interpolation. And as you have separate programs, you cannot exchange your coupling fees through the memory, so you have to do some message passing or some other thing like that, or even file. You can even exchange the coupling field through files on this. So the exchanges, the coupling exchanges per se, uh, may be less efficient than in the previous case. So these are the, the, the first two uh, way to implement the coupling. This is, these are two ways that you can, that you can choose if you don't use any coupling software. But now I will present the two, uh, the two ways that, uh, that uh, uh, coupling software are uh, used and are implemented. So next slide, please. So the first, the first category of coupling software is what I call the integrated coupling framework approach. And this is the approach uh, chosen by ESMF, the Earth System Modeling Framework uh, in the States, or FMS at, FMS at GFDRL of CPL7 and NCAR. So the idea here is that you have your original program, program one and prog two and prog, prog one and prog two here, and you split them into elementary units. You extract only basically the, the signs of your code. And then you use then you, those units you have to adapt the, the code, the data structure, and the calling interface, well, the coupling data structure and the calling interface. And then you use the library to rebuild a new hierarchical merge code into which you can decide when you, when, when you rewrite your code into one coupled application, you can decide to run your original units are either uh, concurrently or one after the other on some um, set of resources. So this is typically, uh, and I will present you in more detail on uh, uh, how that works with uh, ESNF. So next slide, please. So this approach is quite efficient because when you rebuild your new code, you really control how you implement your, your original unit and you really control how you exchange a coupling field. You can decide to uh, write your new code uh, running your units in concurrently one after the other or, or, uh, or, or in parallel. And of course, you can use all the utilities that come with the software regarding the parallelization, the degrading, the time management, for example. The big drawback of this approach is that it's not that easy to implement with existing code because because you have to uh, to split your original, or you have to at least you have to do some quite significant transformation to your coupling code, to your code, your original code, to so to be able to use the software. Next, click please. So I think no previous one. So yeah, so 
My conclusion is that the integrated coupling framework approach like ESNF, FNS, CPS7, that's probably the best solution. That's probably the most efficient solution if you are in a controlled development environment. That is, if everybody can agree to use the same software and to adapt their, their, um, their, their elementary units to the same data structure and coupling interface. If you can reach that level, of agreement regarding the coding, then the, coupling, the integrated coupling approach is probably uh, what you should uh, aim at. Next slide, please. But the reality in many, uh, in many cases is that you don't have uh, that level of agreement, let's say. That's typically the, the, the case, for example, in different codes in, in Europe. We want to couple our codes with the different codes, but we're not ready or we're not coordinated enough to agree on, on one way to rebuild a new code. So basically, with the coupler or coupling library approach, which is the one followed by OASIS, the coupler that I'm develop, developing, uh, MCT in the States, YAC in Germany, the C coupler in China. Here, the philosophy is very different from the previous one. Here, you don't want to, or you want to change your code as little as possible. So basically, you keep your original uh, codes almost untouched. The only thing uh, that you do is to implement some generic uh, call, here CPL send, when you want to send some data, or some generic receiving call, here CPL receive, when you when when the when your code needs some input data, and basically you see here that when you implement those send or receive, you just send some data or ask for some data, but you don't specify in the CPL send or in the CPL receive. You don't specify where the data will go to or where the data will come from. This is all handled by the coupling library, which is linked, which you have to link to your program, and, and the, the, coupling, uh, the coupling layer here in, in red will manage, uh, will implement the coupling exchanges uh, as is specified by the user in an external configuration file. So the uh, next slide, please. Well, next slide, next slide, uh, yeah. So basically, it's um, the big advantage here is that it's quite easy to use with existing codes because you don't you change them as little as possible. You can use all the generic transformation or regridding uh, options that your your coupler or your coupling library offers, and it's pretty good if you want to implement concurrent coupling because you you necessarily run your program at, at the same time on different sets of resources. Uh, it may be less efficient than the previous approach because you necessarily have to exchange your uh, data to message passing. And you end up with a coupled system, which is from where you have different executables. You have your ocean is one executable, your atmosphere is one executable. And, um, and that may be more uh, difficult to debug or harder to manage for the operating system. So next click, please. So basically, my conclusion here is that this approach is probably the best solution when you want to couple the codes that have been developed independently by different groups. So just in summary, you have in the coupling software that exists uh, in, uh, in Earth system modeling, you have two big families. You have either the integrated uh, coupling framework approach, where you, um, you, you split your code into elementary units and you rebuild a new code. And this is, prob this is very, this is, I mean, if you do the work correctly, this will end up with something very efficient, but it's harder to implement if you don't control the coding uh, environment. So if you, uh, if you want to couple codes that are developed independently and if you want to change them as little as possible, if you don't want to have to agree on any standard, then you will, have, you will probably choose the coupling other approach. 
Next slide, please. So now I will. Um, so now, sorry, because I'm trying to follow my notes at the same time. Um, so this um, this gives you a, an overview of the different plotting software that is used in climate modeling. And at the bottom, the horizontal line, you see the years. At the, 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 the box at the top uh, lists you the, the, the software that follow the external copper coupling library. And at the bottom, you have the integrated coupling framework uh, approach. So OASIS started in uh, 1991. And you see that it's been running for quite a long time. And then the first coupler uh, developed at NCAR also followed the same, the same approach, the external coupler or a coupling library. But you see at the bottom here, you have CPL7. The last version of the coupler developed at NCAR, they switched from the external coupler or coupling library, and they, they went to the integrated coupling framework approach. Then in the first category at the top, you also have NCT, the C coupler, as I said, uh, YAC in Germany, uh, Moab temperature map is a new coupler uh, developed in the States. The, the major, the, the, the major uh, representative, uh, representative of uh, the integrated coupling framework approach this started with FMS at GFDL. And then you have ESNF, which I will describe in more detail here, just after. And then, as I said, CPSF. So now, next click. I will give you more detail on on um, OA, well, on FMS, ESNF, CPS7, and then OASIS. Next slide, please. So ESNF, ESNF, it stands for the Earth System Modeling Framework. As I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a typical example of the integrated coupling framework approach. So it's open source software uh, that has been developed um, to coupled uh, model components to form weather, climate, coastal, or other earth science related application. And it has been designed to favor the exchanges of components between uh, American groups. And it's funded by NASA, DOE, NSF, and NOAA, and other partners. It offers some free and active user support. It's written in C++ with some Fortran IT interface and, and C, C++ and Python interface. And uh, they follow very uh, software development uh, techniques. They run um, tests overnight. So it's pretty, pretty good regarding the software engineering. Um, there has been an extension, which I will uh, describe in more detail, which is called New Opsi, which is a layer above ESNF, which is used uh, by the by in the major couple system at NASA, the Navy, and Noah. And uh, now they have more than 30 uh, components that are ESNF and New Opsi compliant. And th those include atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, land ice, hydrology, land surface, chemistry, aerosols, ionosphere, and wave components. Next slide, please. Um, so ESMF is component, has a component-based design. As I said, the, the um, the idea is that he, this is an illustration of GEOS 5, which is a couple model that has been completely uh, designed using ESNF. So you see that each um, each part of the uh, uh, of the climate system is a specific uh, unit, and then. Um, so those are what we call the gridded components. For example, the dynamics or the physics of the uh, of the atmosphere, or um, you have also uh, some um, 
um, some smaller components, for example, the radiation or the chemistry. So they really made uh, each uh, part, each uh, scientific module, uh, they wrote the science and then they, they adapt the, 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 the coupling data structure and the interface. And then they use ESMF to, re to build a, uh, a, a code into which they run some of these um, units in parallel and other uh, uh, well, some of them concurrently and some of them um, sequentially. Next slide, please. So each unit, each part of the code, for example, the radiation code here will be the, the green part, the user code. And then it will be adapted to use ESMF superstructure or an ESMF infrastructure. So basically, the user code lies, lies between the superstructure and the infrastructure. The superstructure is all everything that enters the coupling to the other component, while the infrastructure is everything that enters an efficient execution on the computing resources. Big piece. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. So um, the infrastructure, for example, can be used. So you have specific uh, ESMF routines that you can use in your code to basically do everything that is not the science per se. So uh, the internal prioritization, the management of the time in the calendar, the error handling, um, also the regrading of the, of the, of the fields. So there are two parts in ESMF, the superstructure that allows the user code to communicate with the other component and the uh, infrastructure that can be used to really uh, um, write the, um, the let's say, the technical part of the, of the coding. Next slide, please. Here, I just give you a few um, a few details on how 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 it works to use a superstructure to so that you really understand you know what it means uh, developing a code with ESMF. For example, here at the top on the right, you have a, a subroutine which is my ocean run, and this includes the running part of an ocean model, for example. And you see that uh, this routine is adapted so to get some data in an import state in state and that will and it will produce some data in an export state and you see that the import state for example has to be uh, of type esmf state so that's what i i um, that's what i said i mean you have you take your original ocean ocean code you split you split it at least in, in initialization, in a run and a finalized uh, uh, method. And for each of those parts, you, 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 you adapt uh, the, the interface. And you adhere, I mean, you use the uh, ESMF software. Uh, for example, here, uh, the second, uh, second subroutine that described here is a, is a coupler component. And it's um, uh, it's, a, it's called Ocean to APN CPL, and it will and it will, for example, um, you, I mean the the user that puts an, uh, an ESNF application will use that one to redistribute uh, the cutting field from the uh, ocean to the atmosphere. So you have your, uh, what I call the gridded components. My, this is an example of one gridded component, an example of a coupler component, which are written in the, uh, I mean, using the ESNF software. And then at the bottom, uh, you, uh, you write uh, your new couple code and you use ESNF functions. First, uh, for example, to declare uh, your components here with an ESMF grid comp set entry point. And then you want to run your ocean uh, component. And then you do this by calling the ESMF grid comp run routine with ocean comp as an argument. And then you want to run your uh, coupler component that will be used to use the data from your, uh, from your, from your ocean to your atmosphere. So you call ESMF CPL comp run. 
with ocean to aqueous with CPL as an argument. And then uh, you will uh, run, for example, your atmosphere, which uh, the routine which I just described here. So you see, I think this gives you really a, 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 um, an idea of what it means using ESMF, what it means. I mean, you split your original ocean model or atmosphere model into elementary units. You adapt, you, you make them uh, root, uh, ESMF routines with a specific uh, interface and specific data structure. And then you use ESMF uh, functions to, re, uh, to, build, uh, uh, to rebuild a new couple pool. So that's how it works. I hope this gives you um, an idea of really, you know, how, what it means using the SNF. What, so what it means using what I call the integrated uh, coupling framework approach. A second, next slide, please. Oh no, I just, uh, it's still on the SNF. Yeah. Next slide, please, yeah. Um, I just want to say a word about UOPC, which is, uh, no, please, please this one. This slide, please. No, previous one, not next one. This slide, please. No, you're going down. Can you go up? Can you uh, use a slide 32, show a slide 32? This is 32, right? This is 31. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So, yeah, what is important also to realize is that, I mean, I've shown you how what, what it really means to use EMF, ESMF, and this may be a little bit complex, right? So basically, uh, at one point, it was decided to uh, write a layer on top of ESMF. With, you, you've seen that with ESMF, uh, in principle, you have to use all the ESMF function to, uh, to rewrite a, a new code. Um, basically, what they decided to do is that they decided to uh, design, uh, to write a layer above ESMF and to have predefined uh, driving layers so that uh, the, the work, you know, of um, of, of writing the driving the, the driving layer of using the SMF function to write your code is uh, is done and you just have to uh, uh, use your component in it. So basically, that's the new OPC layer, and you see here that, for example, there are three three um, three existing driver. For example, uh, A here at the left is uh, is what we call the the driver simple. It just implements a coupling between an ocean and atmosphere. So you have a predefined a driver, predefined a mediator and communicator that helps you uh, using the SNF. So this is quite important because I think that today most applications do not implement the SNF directly, but use predefined uh, driver and mediator and connectors offered by the new OPC layer. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, now this is an illustration of CPL7. CPL7 is the last version of the coupler developed at NCAR. Uh, I recall that before CPL7, NCAR was uh, using uh, the coupling uh, software or uh, coupler approach in the sense that they were running your diff their different components separately. But then with CPS7, they decided to follow the, the integrated coupling approach. And But the difference with the SMF is that they have a predefined driver, uh, which is illustrated here. So CPS7, uh, it's developed by NCAR, uh, by the NCAR Earth System Laboratory, and it uses MCT, the model coupling toolkit developed at Argo National Lab for data rebooting and data exchange. And yeah, as I said, they went from the multiple component executable approach with CPL6 to the one executable approach. And they consider it easier to uh, use, to understand, and to debug. Um, it has been ported to different routines uh, and so on. 
So basically, in uh, CPL7 offers uh, a, a layer which uh, which runs as uh, illustrated here. So first, uh, everything that is needed to um, to run the um, yeah. So it first um, it will start, for example, the ocean on a specific uh, set of computing resources. And it provides what is needed. Uh, the, it, uh, the, the driving layer provides the coupling field needed by the ocean, and then it will um, it will uh, it will run what is needed. For example, uh, here land prep, ice prep, um, ocean prep, and uh, this. Um, yeah, and then this will uh, allow to uh, at the bottom to run, for example, the uh, the atmosphere. So next slide, please. I will just show you some. These are typical layouts that are allowed with CPL seven. Uh, at the um, here on on those three, uh, the, you have three different layouts. The time is going from the top to the bottom, and the horizontal ax axis is the, uh, the com are, uh, illustrates the computing resources. So you see here, for, with CPL7, just with an external configuration file, you can decide to run all your components uh, sequentially, that is one after the other, on the whole set of computing resources. That's what you see at the, um, at the left. So all the resources are used to run the what they call the, the flux coupler, and then all resources to, are, run, are used to run the land, and then the ice, and then the atmosphere, and then the ocean. And here, the, the, the numbers are fixed, right? But this is just to give you here. Uh, you see here that the total time for one second period, for example, is 21.3 21 seconds. And you see that regarding the load balancing, it's optimal because all computer, all resources are used all the time, and there's never one component running at the same time. But but you lose one level, of, some level of parallelism. So you may want to implement something which is more like the layout at the uh, at the center, or at the right. In the layout at the center. Uh, um, CPS seven runs the flux coupler, the land, the ice, and the atmosphere sequentially, one after the other on a subset of the resources. But then it runs the ocean uh, at the same time uh, concurrently uh, on a on a different uh, subset of processors. And you see here that um, well, this configuration is not really optimal. Because if you look at the throughput, it's even taking more time than the, the one at the, the left. It's taking overall 22.6 seconds. And regarding the load balancing, it's not either uh, ideal because you see here that the, the, the resources, the cores that are used to run the ocean are, uh, are wasted or do not have anything to do for 7.7 .7 seconds. Uh, the uh, the ocean is just waiting for the um, for the sequence of land ice atmosphere to finish. So uh, the user uh, has played with the different uh, things he can do, and then he has uh, he or she has come to an optimal to a, a better uh, layout. Where you see here at the right that uh, well the ocean is running concurrently. And the number of cores is such that it takes 19.1 seconds to run. Um, then the ice and the atmosphere are running uh, sequentially, one after the other. But then, uh, compared to the central one, the land and the ice are also running in parallel. And you see that there is some load imbalance. For example, the land has to wait for 5.2 seconds. Um, and the atmosphere is waiting for one second for the ocean to finish. But overall, this is still what gives you the best throughput in the sense that the, the number of cores you decide to give to each of those uh, the subcomponents uh, gives a throughput of 19.1 seconds. Of course, these are just examples, but this is just to tell you that CPL7 
offers you the possibility to run your different uh, component on different uh, set of cores and in different sequential or uh, configuration. And so depending on the on the platform, you can uh, play with that and you can find an optimal layout for, um, for your model. Uh, next click, please. Yeah, just to say that the the, uh, the performance of this uh, of CPL seven were analyzed. You have here the the, the reference, and it's quite, uh, quite quite good. So next slide, please. Now on FMS. So FMS is uh, FMS is I, I think it's the first integrated coupling approach uh, software that was uh, designed in the state. And it's been active for more than two decades at JFDL. And in a sense, it's a bit the um, the ancestor of ESNS because the the the, the idea are, are the same. Uh, FMS offers a superstructure that manages everything um, to couple the, a component with the other components, the rest of the coupled system. And FMS offers an infrastructure that the user can can use in his code. To manage the uh, the I/O, the time management, the parallelism, and so on. So it's it's really the same philosophy and idea than ESNS. Uh, next slide, please. And here I want to just to just a few words about a very nice feature in FMS. It's the exchange grid. So when you have um, Yeah, and so uh, is what we call an exchange grid. An exchange grid is defined uh, between two components by the intersection of all the cells of the two parent grids. You see, for example, here you have an, uh, an example in yellow. In yellow, it's the exchange grid between the atmosphere grid and the land, ice, or land, ocean grid. Um, so you see, you see here that in the exchange grid, you have one cell defined for each couple of atmosphere and ocean grid. And basically, um, oops, sorry, just a second. So, so when the coupling fields are um, are trans or are transferred from, for example, the atmosphere to the land ice uh, surface module. They are, the coupling fields are first expressed on the exchange grid, and, and then um, they are possibly aggregated uh, on, uh, to match the cell of the other grid. Um, yeah, next click, please. What is really nice also about ESNF is that it allows uh, the coupling uh, uh, software allows an implicit calculation of the vertical diffusive flux over the whole column. So again, you have the diffusion equation here. You have uh, when you uh, discretize it, you have this up and down sweep of a triangle. You need to solve uh, a tri, tri diagonal matrix, and you do this by an up and down sweep, calculating the precision of the matrix. And um, with the SNF, you can do that even if you have different grids in the uh, atmosphere and in, um, in, in the land, and you go through the exchange grid. And then you exp and, the, and the exchange grid is where the flux, the fluxes are computed, taking into account the properties of, of really the atmosphere and really the, uh, the land cell uh, corresponding to the exchange grid cell. Okay, so that's about it for ESNF and FMS and CBS7. And now a few words on OASIS, which, next slide, please. So this is the copier that uh, we are developing at Surfax. So OASIS is uh, developed since 1991. And we first had the series of OASIS 1, OASIS 2, OASIS 3, which was not parallel. And then during the prison project, we started developing OASIS 4, but that was not so successful. So then we stopped. And at one point within the easiest project, we decided to interface 
below the OASIS API, we use MCT, the model cropping toolkit, which then um, uh, allowed, which then this gave OASIS to MCT, which is a fully parallel. And now the last version of OASIS uh, MCT is the 4.0 delivered in 2018. So everything in, um, in uh, OASIS is um, public domain, it's uh, ad, uh, open source. Next slide, please. OASIS Swim City is used by uh, at least 67 climate modeling groups in the world uh, to assemble more than 80 couple applications. And you have here the geographical uh, location of those groups. Um, and this is based on a user survey we did in, in, in 2019. And OASIS Swim City is used in five of the seven European ESNs which that participate to CINET 6. Uh, next slide, please. So OASIS follows the what I call the copying, uh, copying library or copy approach. And as I said, the idea here is that you, you want to change your code as little as possible. You just want to implement few calls in your code to, uh, to do the copying, but that's it. You don't want to change your code. So basically, this, uh, this gives you really uh, what in, a practical example of what it means using uh, OASIS in your code. You first, in the initialization phase, you have to call an OASIS in your form to do the initialization of the coupling. And then this is a very important call. You have to call an OASIS dev partition. And that's where each process will uh, tell OASIS which part of the global domain it covers. And this will allow OASIS to perform, uh, to, to calculate the communication patterns between the, the source and the target grids. Then you have a, a call to define the grid, OASIS find grid. Then a call to define, to declare the copying fee on that, and then you, 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 you finish the, the, the definition phase with an OASIS in depth. So that's what you have to do for the, in the initialization part. And then to perform the copying exchanges in your code, you, you implement an, a call to OASIS put, or uh, to receive a copying field to OASIS get. And what you have to indicate here is a date, which um, which tells OASIS at which time this code or this get is valid. And then you have the, the array containing the copying field. What you see here that in the OASIS code or in the OASIS get, there is no uh, specification. Uh, I mean, the, when, when the model implements an OASIS code, the code itself does not know where it will send the data you know, to. And when it implements an OASIS get, the code itself does not know where it gets the data from. This is all configured externally by the user for each specific uh, uh, one uh, in an external configuration file. And this, this is what gives you the flexibility to change. For example, you may, you, 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 you may want to change the copying frequency. You may want to change the, the the target of an OASIS put, uh, and you don't have to change anything in your code, you just change your external configuration. So this is why we say that OASIS is quite flexible. And then you have an OASIS terminate uh, to finalize the run. And let's see. And next slide, please. Now, regarding the parallelization, the, the, the communication, um, the, the, the little figure here illustrates uh, a coupling, coupling exchanges between model one and model two. You see here that they have different grids. And here in this example, we suppose that model one is running on three process, uh, processes, model two on four, and each one has a uh, specific um, uh, part of the decomposition. So basically, the, the code, what the code has to do is that it has to express each process when it calls the OASIS death partition. It describes the local partition that, it's, that it supports. And with this description, it is the copying library that will uh, define the communication pattern 
and that will define which data has to go where between the source and the target. And this is automatically done by the by the by Oasis. Um, of course, the, the interpolation weights, I mean, you see here that you have two different grids. So you have, so to do the coupling, you have to express the coupling field, which is, uh, which is provided by model one on its grid. You have to transform it to express it on model two grid. And you can do that with the, um, with Oasis, with the script library. And just to mention, we also have an IO function that is, you may, uh, for example, uh, if model one is, run, is running standalone, uh, it's not coupled to model two, well, it may get uh, whatever it needs uh, from files. And again, you don't have to change anything in your code to do that. You just, it's just that in, in the external configuration file, you specify that the data can come from some file. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this this just gives you um, uh, what are the options in Oasis to uh, like for the regridding, for the interpolation, so to express the coupling field, express on the source grid, on the target grid. So you have in orange, this is the source grid, and in blue, you have one target point. So you have different algorithm, uh, you can have a nearest neighbor uh, nearest neighbor uh, algorithm where basically for each target grid point you use uh, some uh, the nearest neighbors on the source grid. You can have a bilinear, you can choose a bilinear interpolation where basically it's the four enclosing neighbors on the target grid, on the source grid that I use for each target point. You can have a uh, the cubic interpolation where basically you use the, the, the four enclosing neighbors, but also their uh, their gradients, uh, so to get a higher order interpolation. Or you can have also a conservative remapping, where for each target cell, you use the values of the uh, source cells that uh, intersect. The target cell. This is in the middle on the right. So you have different algorithm, and basically, um, I mean, all or most coupling software offer uh, those type of uh, of reviewing. But in Oasis, currently, it's implemented with the script library. And we uh, next slide, please. We recently uh, did a benchmarking. Ah, you don't have the number, do you? Okay, you don't have the, okay, no. I'll just say it already. Uh, it's not the, the presentation that I just sent this afternoon, but that's okay. Um, just to say that we uh, recently evaluated, we did a benchmarking exercise between the different uh, copying software regarding the reading library. Uh, and it's very interesting. We see that, for example, ESNF is much, uh, more performant than the script library that we have currently in um, Oasis. And that's why we want to uh, offer also the possibility to the user, for the user to calculate the weights with the SNF. And this will be possible with the next version of Oasis. So if you want more detail on this, just ask me. Uh, regarding coupling algorithm, I will not spend too much detail on that, but I just want to show you, to, to to, to tell you that. Next slide, please. That the coupling between ocean and atmosphere is not implemented the same way in all the ASMs. This is how it's implemented in most European um, G, uh, GCM, for example, at Meteo France, at IPSL in Paris. Uh, in EC Earth, which is the uh, European Community Model, MPIESM in Germany, and HADGEM in, uh, in the UK. This is the asynchronous coupling that I already presented. So basically, you have the time running horizontally, and at the top, you have uh, the uh, orange uh, arrows that represent the atmosphere running, and at the bottom, you have the ocean and ice running. 
So basically, they uh, run uh, concurrently at the same time on separate sets of computing resources. They compute a, a coupling period. At the end of the coupling period, they exchange the coupling field, and then they go on for the next coupling period. And here, basically, the uh, the ocean and ice model they uh, send the sur some surface uh, variables like the temperature, the albedo, the velocities, and the, the fluxes, uh, so the latent, sensible, so turbulent fluxes, latent, sensible, and long wave um, uh, fluxes are calculated in the atmosphere, uh, as well as the water fluxes, for example, the evaporation, uh, the sublimation, the rain, the snow. And so the, those fluxes are sent uh, from the atmosphere to the ocean. So you see here that um, I mean there is some asynchronicity because it means that for some period n, uh, the atmosphere will see the surface property of the ocean calculated at the, for the previous period. So there's some some lag here, but you know that's that's what we do, and we're starting to to evaluate more precisely the impact of doing that. Next slide, please. This is the coupling algorithm implemented in, in, um, in ECMWF. And this is very different because you see here that the ocean and the atmosphere are not running concurrently. They're really running one after the other. First, the atmosphere runs, and then it delivers some um, some fields to here in green at the middle, the wave model, uh, UA, well, the velocity, U and V. The atmosphere also calculates uh, some fluxes, and, it's, uh, and it will, uh, this would be an input for the ocean. So first the atmosphere runs, and then the wave model runs, and then the ocean runs. So here the the, the implementation is very different from the previous one. The different components, they run one after the other on the same set of resources. So this is really, they, um, they really implemented a sequential coupling at ECMWF. Just another example, next slide, please. This is what they do at Environment Canada. Yeah. Uh, so, so basically, they, um, um, what, what they wanted to implement is that they, they wanted to, uh, in, in the end, run their model concurrently, but they also want to make sure that uh, there's no asynchronicity uh, between the, the atmosphere to ocean, but there's an asynchronicity of two coupling periods for the ocean to atmosphere. So anyway, I will not details, I will not provide all the details here, but you see uh, they start by running the, uh, the ocean, which calculates, uh, some fluxes are calculated in the ocean at the, at the resolution of the surface, so that's good. These fluxes are used to run the first period of the atmosphere and then the second period and then even the third one. So you see there's this, this big blue um, arrow, arrow uh, from uh, ocean at time one to atmosphere time two. So there's a, there's a, there's a lag of two coupling periods for the fields that are sent from the ocean to the atmosphere. But in the other direction, you see that the coupling fields that are calculated by the atmosphere during the second period are used by the ocean during the second period. So for the fields that are sent to the atmosphere, from the atmosphere to the ocean, there is no lag. So anyway, so this is it's just really interesting to see that the implementation of, I mean, even the simple um, ocean atmosphere cutting is done very differently. Uh, in the different groups. And then the last example and the most complex one. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's 
it's what is implemented uh, at NCAR. And I will not give all the details here, but just uh, for example, just to show you that, for example, the land in green runs for one period. The ice also runs in parallel uh, in, uh, in light blue. And then we have also the flux copper, uh, CPL, that one. Those three uh, surface units, they uh, produce some, uh, they, they calculate the fluxes that are merged in red by the module merge, and they are then uh, used by the atmosphere for the same cutting period. So you see here that it's, it's uh, more sophisticated, and then the ocean is running in parallel. But I mean, if you look at the details, there is, in fact, um, for the field sent from the um, atmosphere to the, uh, to, the, to the ocean, there is also a lag of two cutting periods. So, just uh, to summarize this last uh, part, uh, the way the exchanges, the coupling algorithm, are implemented in the different in the different GCMs can be very different. And um, if you want more details, then I can give you other those details. So, next slide, please, and here are my conclusions. So, uh, as an overview, I just show, show, I, I showed you that planes with the lags of the different coupling fields, you can implement a sequential or a concurrent coupling between two components. Of course, what you can do is dictated by the, by the science and also by the numerical stability. But in principle, I mean, you, you can try different things, so to use your resources uh, optimally. There are advantages and disadvantages of the different implementation in terms of, of performance. Um, and when you, when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when, when you run a couple system, you have to be aware that this may be very important. And you really have to understand how you implement, how your different components run on the different uh, resources that you have. Uh, do they run at the same time? Is there some load imbalance? Can I optimize the throughput? And you know, all those questions, they have to be uh, present in your head because it's not, I mean, it's, it, it may be, I mean, many people run just a couple system without really understanding how the resources are used and that's not very optimal. And then I presented uh, some coupling software, ESNF, CPS7, FNS, and Oasis. And then I, um, I I try to classify the coupling software into an external coupler or coupling library, and in the integrated coupling framework approach. Uh, these are two approaches that are very different. Each one has uh, advantage and disadvantages, and you have to really understand uh, that before choosing one approach or the other. And then finally, I showed you some coupling algorithm implemented in real coupled GCMs uh, that illustrates sequential concurrent coupling. And this shows you that you know the, the implementations uh, are really uh, diverse. And that's it. Um, do we have questions? I guess three hours of lecture in a row is not that easy to take. Please do not hesitate if you do have questions. I don't see anything on the chat, but as the other speakers, I'm... Uh, oh, someone is writing something. I'll just wait for that. Or maybe you can, you can ask a question orally too. Can I ask a small question? Sure. Uh, uh, just uh, in the model of uh, OSMF, you mentioned that they do uh, thousands of this automatically every night. So, uh, just wonder uh, what is the purpose of these tests? 
Uh, it's, uh, I mean, you want to make sure that when you uh, change something in your code, uh, it does not have some um, some side effects. So they have those, uh, I mean, I think that it's each time something changes in the code, and, you know, they, they always, they, they are always uh, doing a development, so they, they want to make sure that everything is, um, that there's no yeah, side effect. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. Okay. No other questions? Yeah. Maybe another small question. Uh, if we launch uh, programs, a couple of programs, uh, uh, we, maybe we can monitor the uh, job loading. Uh, so what kind of a, uh, what kind of sim uh, signal of job loading is is good to is good or to in, in your opinion? You mean to measure the the load balancing, right? Yeah. Um, we do have a tool in. I mean, if you use the Discoverer, we do have a tool which is called Lucia that will. Uh, that will in the end gives you, you know, um, an illustration of uh, each of the process and how it's used, and so you will see which one are idle or not. And but uh, you have uh, this. This will be available. Like I mean, we have a, the first version of Lucia, but I mean the the more the more sophisticated one will be available in December in the next version. Um, but you have a whole session. I think it's tomorrow or on Wednesday. Um, in this summer school about tools to measure the performance. And this is typically what you can do. So I encourage you to, uh, it's a talk by um, the people from BSC, uh, Mario Acosta and Kim Seraden. So if you're interested in that, just uh, listen to that, to that session. Okay. 